was always mindful of that as an MC, and he always said, every time he got up, he said, you know, I'm always mindful of not speaking too long, and he remembers that the shortest speech he ever heard was at a sex convention. A sex convention, where the featured speaker got up and said, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure, and he sat down. <laughs> so, without further ado, Dr. Frank Sabatini. that some of the new people that are here for the first time, actually we're having some discomfort, you know, bloating, distension. You're getting used to a new way of eating, so give it a chance. I know sometimes it may feel a little heavy at first, you're adjusting to the food, it's different, and some people are having a little bit of trouble with that. That will change. Eat slowly, don't drink with your meal, just do all of that. And actually, uh, it brings to mind a, a story that will tie into that. And it's a story about this little Italian uh, woman who gets on an elevator, and on the elevator is this very posh woman from Beverly Hills, all dressed to the nines. And the Italian lady gets in the elevator and says, what's that? She said, that's Chanel number five, $99 an ounce. With that, the old lady lets out some very silent and deadly gas in the elevator. <laughs> and, the, and the posh woman from Beverly Hills says, what's that? She said, that's a broccoli rob and beans, $3 an ounce. <laughs> Uh, today I want to share with you uh, one of my favorite stories because uh, as we have gotten more complex with the discoveries of science, especially in the field of genetics, we have somehow in some ways really separated ourselves from the profound simplicity that uh, Dr. Esser alluded to yesterday that is tied into very simple lifestyle habits and today I want to really emphasize how getting back to those simple choices has now been shown to change things at the deepest level of complexity. And I think when you get hit with that and you realize that, um, it'll put the power back in your hands. It'll make you feel more connected again to how important making simple, positive lifestyle choices can be. And when we talk about whether it's vegan nutrition, plant-based, even some issues with fasting. We're going to get into a little bit of exercise and stress management. We're going to talk about a few things and I'm going to show you that at the deepest level, the data that's being generated now will change things as far and as deep as you can go on a cellular level. And I really want to share that with you so you're, you really have this sense of how powerful that is. Right now, there are several health concepts that we operate from. The first is the one that has been very dominant over a very long period of time, and that, of course, is the disease entity model, which is a major model of medicine. Now, understand this has historical perspective going way back, where we, as humans, were living in a very <coughs> austere, uncomfortable, and challenging environment. And to make sense from the inexplicable forces around us, we started describing all of these natural elements of nature with their own identity. So there were wind gods and sun gods. And we oriented ourselves outside the body to these forces of change. And we invested uh, our, our faith, our hope, and our trust in voices of authority outside of ourselves. And we had the evolution of gurus and priests and physicians and the like. And then, of course, around the 19th, 18th and 19th century, we had the discoveries by Pasteur of bacteria and later viruses, and now we put a face on all of those forces from the outside that flew in to now take possession of our bodies and soul. First it was the soul, now we had possession of the body. And it created a model of disease as being a thing to be attacked by drugs and surgery, treating basically symptoms, not causes. Now, at the time of Pasteur, there was even a very famous chemist, Beauchamp, who said, look, there are bacteria, but they are correlative, not causative. The only reason they exist is because the body is already challenged, diseased, broken down, and toxic. And on his deathbed, it is reported that Pasteur, on his deathbed, agreed with Beauchamp and said, basically in French, which I can't do, environment is everything. 
And so he agreed that while these things exist, so this model still basically exists and it's a challenge because that's why in medical practice, it's not about getting people well, it's about hand-holding their pathology and their disease and often putting them on a life sentence of a, if you will, a shopping bag or shopping list full of meds. Then, of course, we have a model that is what we'll call holistic process and lifestyle modification. Now, this is a very important piece because this challenges just that disease entity model, where now disease or disease is a process, and we're now no longer putting our faith and hope and voices of authority outside of ourselves, but understanding that the wisdom and power that operates within the body itself is within our reach. It is on the job every second of every day. No one needs to tell it what to do. No one needs to lead it what to do. No one needs to tell the liver how to detoxify. It is built into the wisdom and intelligence of a system that is organizing and maintaining itself in the face of change to maintain the status of health and well-being. And this is very important. Because right now in the United States, we are spending between two and two and a half trillion dollars a year on health care. Now let me emphasize how intense that is. Imagine that you could spend two million dollars a day. Anybody like to try to do that? I don't even know if you could do it. If you could spend two million dollars a day, every day since the day that Jesus Christ was born until the present day, you would not spend $2 trillion. We are spending that yearly on a health care budget, and that wouldn't be so bad if there was an interesting return on our investment, but there is not. And what we have now discovered, and many health policy experts have addressed this, that 75% in that range of all the major problems we suffer with are basically solved by what? By hygienic choices of plant-based foods, exercise, stress management, and so lifestyle approaches. So not making more medicine more available, not making doctors and insurance more available to more people. All these arguments that we constantly get into, needing more insurance coverage and care, we need less of that. We need more of the idea that this is very a profound situation and change. Now, we're gonna go past that for a second. When we look at what's going on, I'm going to come back. Don't worry, we'll come back to that. When we look at this very simple graph here of the estimated impact of the increasing trend in obesity, you begin to see how this lifestyle approach impacts our story. And if you'll see on this particular graph that's from the Health Survey of England, you'll see that by 2023, which is really only five years from now, there's an estimated almost 55% increase in type 2 diabetes, a 28%, almost 30% increase in high blood pressure, 20% increase in heart attacks. So what we're talking about is we're seeing this escalation in the face of huge money spent with this disease entity model when we in fact know that the best care and treatment for these problems is really us taking advantage of what we can do daily to improve our quality of life and health. So we come to that because the third model of our story is the one that we're going to address today to some degree. Because with the Human Genome Project, now we have this idea that there is genetic predetermination. The idea that let's not get lost so much in lifestyle choice, let's not get so lost in disease entity that we'll treat it that way, but that there is a set of genetic constructs that we all have, and heredity that's been handed down generation to generation, that, that is involved with our diseases, dysfunction, psychological, and behavioral changes, and that this deck of genetic cards is going to dictate the possibilities that you have for being well or being diseased. And it's not that that doesn't operate, and it's not that these are all mutually exclusive the way they have been presented, because they can integrate to some degree. But the bottom line is, you're going to see that when we talk about this situation, we're dealing with genes. Now genes, there are about 25,000 genes in the human genome. This comes from the Human Genome Project. What is a gene? It's a spiraling sequence of DNA, which you see here, you see that little spiral like a helix. You see the blue bars and the yellow bars connected. 
Those are the base pairs of the genetic code, and it is exactly that. It is a code that is arranged in the chromosomes of the body, which are here, and that code is a blueprint for everything, every protein in that human body. So hair color, eye color, hormones, enzymes, everything we do is based on that print. So that genetic code informs and expresses the needs, the chemistry of that human body, and the physical appearance and psychological identity. And so bottom line here, and you can see this part too, your waste problem is partly genetic and partly Boston free cotton. So, now, the key to all of this is, though, is really to understand that genes may load the gun, but your lifestyle pulls the trigger. And we're going to talk today about the importance and the understanding of how routine lifestyle changes can modify the genetic machinery at the deepest cellular level. And you're going to see that simple choices, lifestyle choices of food, activity, and stress have the greatest impact on modifying this very deep construct. Epigenetic beginning. In 1940s, there's a British biologist, Conrad Waddington, described the importance of the interplay of genes and the environment. This was the beginning, in a way, of the concept of what we call epigenetics, meaning you have a hardwired genetic program. It's there. But we now know that factors from the outside become incredibly important for determining what of that is going to express or not express. Now, why is that important? Well, we looked at that, that graph of heart disease and cancer and all of that. And we know right now that if you take yourself and look at the two people next to you on each side of you, right now in America, one in every three people will have cancer in your lifetime. So one of you, according to the statistics, but of course nobody in this room, so there's going to be whole rows of people. But the bottom line is, and we have, uh, so the bottom line here is that the, the epi, this environment of the interplay, the environment, has a huge impact. And we now know that the environment and hygienic factors, vegan diet, exercise, and I'll even throw fasting for protein manipulation, which we'll talk about, can affect how and how many of your genes express on a daily basis. And we have to embrace the idea that how you eat, move, think, handle stress, function, is going to change your deck of genetic cards and your predetermined gene pool. And this becomes very important because as you well know, we have many people right now doing a lot of these genetic programs. You've seen 23andMe, you've seen all of these things. There's now a way when you get that information it will go into a program that some doctors use and give you what's called a nutrigenetic analysis. And that analysis will look at the construct that comes back from 23andMe and then give you a litany of supplements and recommendations based on whatever the changes or morphology changes, mutations that they see in that. Not really addressing the idea that that's a changeable environment. That's something that's mutable, it's plastic, it's not set in stone. And I think you can classically see how this plays with fear. How many times have you heard, I've heard, and you may have said it yourself, my father had high blood pressure, my grandfather had high blood pressure. I'm gonna have high blood pressure. Does it really matter? My father had high blood sugar, my grandfather had high blood sugar, diabetes is in my cards. We now know that that's absolutely untrue. And many people make major life decisions based on what they think is that predetermined gene pool, being absolutely shackled, handcuffed to that predetermination. Think about people who wind up discovering that they have a BRCA gene, which may be involved with breast cancer. And without any waiting to see what may occur based on a probability, they will surgically mutilate that body to remove those breasts, to remove the ovaries, to do whatever. Not realizing that the plasticity of that environment is changeable. It's functionally changeable. And the other side of that coin is important to realize too. For the longest time in countries in Asia, for example, they had a very low outcome of heart disease and reproductive cancers. And of course, that had to do with eating a more plant-based, lower-fat diet. But as Asia, China, Japan started to embrace the eating habits of the West, 
with all the junk food and high protein and high fat, guess what happened? They got all the epidemics of heart disease and cancer that we have, but get this, regardless of their way different genetic differences. So as much as those differences, and because the Asian genetics is very different than ours, but those lifestyle factors had a huge impact of creating the same outcomes. So the point of this is we don't want to get lost in that genetic environment. We want to respect it. We want to know that there is some establishment of a hard wire, but the soft, the soft part of our program, the soft changes that go on, the software that are involved with us making changes and choices can absolutely shift the expression of the outcome of what is going to occur. And that puts the power back into your hands. Now, from the standpoint of the impact of nutrition on genes, this is just some data that I want to share. Uh, this was a study that Ornish had done with people with prostate cancer, and they did biopsies of men with prostate cancer, and they did a three-month lifestyle change that included plant foods less than 10% fat. It involved walking 30 minutes six times a week, and it involved yoga and psychological support. What they discovered was that 453 genes that were involved with cancer suppression in these tumors were absolutely shut off. Please understand that. So this was a mind, this is a body lifestyle evaluation that demonstrated a direct connection between expression of cancer genes and routine lifestyle change. We're gonna get into how some of those modifications are made. Now, in a year follow-up, they still have significant decrease in PSA, though that's not the best measurement for what's going on in the prostate, but it is still used. And the cancer growth was eight times less than the unmodified control group. So that maintained a tremendous reduction in that cancer production by the simple act of these routine lifestyle changes. You need to really think about that in your mind, process that. And what they also discovered was that people with heart disease following this dietary regimen had significant decreases in weight and blood pressure, which we would expect. We see it all the time. But this is what was important about that. The results were that after 12 weeks, the decreased activity of 23 genes, and after one year, 143 genes that typically promote inflammation and blood vessel injury were turned off. So did it matter that they were there? It matters to some degree, but the fact is you had the power by that simple set of choices turn that on or to turn that off. So we don't need to get lost in what the anatomy is. We don't need to get lost in the hardwired nature of that. We need to understand again that when you make these choices, you've got an opportunity that we never knew before. It's something we never had an inkling of. We could think about it, but now we can measure it. Now, in another study, we know that nutrients and plants can modulate gene expression. That means can turn things on and off. And plants have more than 50 to 60 times more oxidant potential than meat, poultry, and eggs. And you've heard that from a number of researchers and people, doctors here this week. This was a first-time study of widespread gene expression in whole blood. So they looked at blood cells and the genetic environment, knowing that every cell of your body has all the chromosomes and all the complement of genes that the entire body has. Every cell has to have that. And this was, they looked at, what they were looking at is how does the body defend itself in the face of a toxic input like smoking. So these were smokers, and they were looking at cellular defense. And the, the highest antioxidant group in this study got berries, pomegranates, grapes, cabbage, walnuts, broccoli. They also got green tea and chocolate because of the antioxidant nature of what this was. Are we recommending green tea and chocolate? Not really, but they did it in this study. Another group, interestingly enough, they must have been an Australian group, because this was a Kiwi group. <laughs> With all due respect to all my people from down under that. And then the third group was on a control group eating a conventional diet. The result was the group on the Kiwi itself did, did show a promoted activity of about five genes that repair DNA, compared to 25 repair genes in the group that were eating the highest antioxidants from plants and vegetables. Now, what does that mean? You have enzymes in the body that will repair, you have to understand when cells are reproducing, genes can go through mutation, they can have damages, they can have nicks and cracks and cuts. So the body in its wisdom has repair enzymes, which are proteins, that are coded for by the same genetic machinery 
that when they are produced, they will heal and fix. They're like little repair enzymes that will go in and fix those strains of DNA. So under toxic input from the environment, environmental toxins, poisons, bad foods, we have damage that goes on the DNA. There's mutations, there's damage. But these repair enzymes were remarkably enhanced. The genes that code for the repair proteins were dramatically enhanced by the antioxidant nature of fruits and vegetables. Again, think about that. On the deepest cellular level, we have repaired the wisdom of the body being promoted by the simple act of eating in the way that you were really created to eat. Not a big mystery, but a magnificent observation, right? Now, a broad vegan plant-based diet was the impact of this study, can affect the genetic production of DNA repair enzymes and cellular defense and immune protection. So we know that when you're eating in a more plant-based manner, there's many benefits that happen, enhancing immunity. We talked a little bit yesterday about prostaglandins and omega fatty acids and how that's part of an enhanced immune responsiveness. Here we see that these repair enzymes are so dramatically helping in cellular defense and immune protection. Now, how does the DNA get modified in a way that can actually turn genes on and off? It's a great question. And I'm gonna share just two things with you that do it, and one is a process that we call methylation. Now, what we find is that methyl groups, what is a methyl group? It's just a carbon atom that has a couple of hydrogens, a few hydrogens around it, but that methyl group can be tacked on, it can be added to, it can be attached to that genetic machinery from the outside, and when it does, it's changing how that gene code is gonna code for those proteins. It can actually shift how it does that. Now, so it affects the transcription. Transcription just means the creation. Think about if you were a transcriber taking notes. Your genetic code provides the code for how the body will transcribe the proteins that we have. So we find now that when these methyl groups are added to the gene pool, it can change the transcription, the code, how those proteins are expressed, right? Now, this is a nice picture of that. Here's the DNA, you see these sugar phosphate backbone, all the base pairs. This is, these are the basic nucleotides, the DNA building blocks. Together, a gene is gonna be a series or sequence of those building blocks. And these beautiful lit up white lights are the methyl groups that have been added to that gene pool. So you get a picture of what I'm talking about. You're seeing that, that, methyl, that methylation is just adding something to the chemistry of that genetic machinery, all right? Now, what are the nutritional sources of DNA methylation? They've been around for quite a while. You've got methyl groups are found in all of the B vitamins. So when you look at all of the things like B12, B6, riboflavin, all of these B vitamins are providing, and even things like Sam A, they're foods rich with methyl groups, and this comes from foods that are high in folate, because one of the great methyl donors even in normal methylation, but even in DNA methylation, it's going to be folic acid. There's an activated form of it that is what the body will use to methylate this stuff. But see that it comes from strawberry citrus, and especially leafy green veggies. The greens, greens, green. I want your blood to turn green like Dr. Spock. I want it to get green. Now, this is very important because this methylation from the greens is going to provide all of that. And this is just a cartoon of all of those forms of methylation. And then you've got choline and wheat germ, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, oxidizes to produce a source of methyl, of methyl called betaine, which is also called trimethylglycine, trimethyl. There's three methyl groups that it can donate to this methylation process, okay? at different places all along the gene pool, all right? And then, finally, diets deficient in these foods can cause DNA to be under-methylated and promote cancer growth and change. So the methylation process is kind of an intriguing epigenetic phenomenon. And folic acid and folium is really important. Where does folic acid come from? It comes from the Latin word folium, which gives us the word foliage. So what is it coming from? 
plants. Green, 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 green. All those leafy greens up the wazoo. <laughs> Breakfast, lunch, dinner, eat them green. All right, now. When we talk about physical activity, this is kind of an intriguing piece. Because it's hard to imagine how the simple act of moving the body is going to shift and make methylation changes and changes in the gene pool that can now modify what we express at a genetic level. But it does. Methylation can occur, this is important, at sites in the gene pool that either promote or suppress tumors. Understand this. If you think about the gene pool, that spiral staircase of DNA, and sections of that being the genetic construct that's going to dictate the color of your eyes or a hormone or an enzyme, along the site of that spiral staircase, there are going to be genes that can actually promote or suppress cancer growth and disease change. And wherever that gets attached to, wherever it gets methylated, it may either promote or suppress cancer change. So it's a very flexible plastic system. It's not just a one outcome system. But with activity, this is kind of intriguing. Physical exercises decrease or even reverses promoter methylation. That means it reverses the methylation at sites on the genes that promote cancer. Think about that. The physical activity alone blocks the methylation at what we call promoter sites, cancer-promoting sites, and the risk of development of breast cancer. Now, we've known for a long time, women that exercise on a routine basis have a very significant decrease in the risk and outcome of breast cancer. Now we're seeing some of the reason why. And this is profound because it's happening at such a deep cellular level. We find that women exercising the equivalent of 25 minutes five times a week for six months significantly altered the methylation of 43 genes, three of which were involved in breast cancer survival. Okay, do you think we need to move? You betcha. Yes, Women who exercised longer had even lower levels of promoter methylation and a greater expression of tumor suppressor genes and more than a 60% decrease in the risk of breast cancer death. So think about morbidity, mortality, life, promotion, Exercise was critical in this process. Exercise affects also the expression of genes that enhance metabolism, affecting the improvement of muscle growth and stamina. Remember, as you get older, there's something that happens, a natural loss of muscle mass. We call that sarcopenia. Muscles harbor energy in a form of a sugar called muscle glycogen. When you lose muscle mass, guess what? You lose the ability to store energy. So as you get older, sometimes you have that feeling of getting older and more tired. Anybody in the room get older and more tired? Anybody in the room? <laughs> so you go to your doctor and he says, Doc, I'm tired. He says, no, you're older and more tired. You have senile fatigue. I already knew that, Doc. How do I fix it? You've got to improve muscle mass. So exercise, including some resistance, weight training, movement. And when we talk about movement with exercise, Understand we're talking about the idea that you're going to push the body with some form of an aerobic activity, which means that when you use large postural muscles, walking, running, biking, skating, these muscles use fat as their energy source and demand oxygen. So when we talk about aerobic training, we're putting muscles in play that will utilize fat for energy and burn and use oxygen to make that conversion. So we want to push the body in a way that's going to push that kind of oxygen availability and movement, and that's what we call aerobic activity, basically. But what we find is that, that that kind of activity has an impact on affecting body fat, weight gain, modest changes in blood pressure, modest changes in cancer risk, like we talked about, and that's so modest as, as we saw it here. So we want to get into some form of activity that you're going to do at least four times for about 30 minutes. And I've replaced the concept of exercise with activity because I want you to find something you love doing. Because if you love doing it, guess what? You'll continue to do it. You like to dance, dance four times a week. You like to swim, swim four times a week. You like to run, run four times a week. But nobody gets a reprieve. The only person who gets a reprieve are people that can't pass the George Burns orthopedic test. This is one of the famous tests in orthopedics. 
Everybody remember George Burns, the comedian with the big cigar? Here's the George Burns orthopedic text. If you put your hands over your head and out to the side, and you don't hit the side of a coffin, you can walk. <laughs> That's the George Burns orthopedic text. Now, so we want to get some simple movement on a routine basis. Make it fun, make it something you dig doing, but make no mistake. That simple process of movement has huge impact beyond our wildest imagination. And increasing a little bit of weight training and resistance training will also build that muscle mass. I feel that that's it. So nobody, I, I recommend it four times a week. The only people that I recommend less than four times a week are people that do this. If you get up in the morning and you look in your mirror and you do this, God bless, look at me. <laughs> Three times for you. Everybody else. Everybody else four times. Now this is kind of interesting. Exercise and met we've known for a while that some of the better studies on depression show that exercise in some ways is far better than many of the meds that are used to treat it. Just a fact. In fact, Placebos are at least as good, if not better, than the drugs used to treat. There are placebo studies that are mind-blowing that do better on depression than any of the drugs used to treat. Here we see that exercise and methylation from things like folate and sandine increase, this is interesting, they increase transport proteins in brain cells. That means they're urging the genes in a brain cell to produce and transcribe what are called transporter proteins that maintain the healthy reuptake of transmitters in the brain. And understand this, many of the drugs used to treat depression are what we call serotonin reuptake inhibitors, selective serotonin reuptake, SSRI drugs. So when a nerve releases its transmitter, that transmitter goes in a space called a synapse. It stimulates another nerve in sequence. And that transmitter, if it lingers too long, may create abnormal activity, whether it's serotonin, dopamine, or whatever. So the body not only releases it, but it has a backup control system where it can literally suck that back up after it releases it. We call that reuptake. Now, most of the drugs used to treat depression are reuptake inhibitors. They block the reuptake, so the transmitter lingers longer in the space, taking away the feeling of depression. The problem is, it creates such an abnormal circumstance where the brain believes it's making enough of what it has, when in fact it's not. So if you stop those drugs too abruptly, you will have such a drop in your emotional state that there can be suicide. And we see this typically with children. The bottom line is, we find that this kind of methylation and exercise actually promotes the proteins that remarkably improve a healthy balance of reuptake of those transmitters so that this methylation process and this nutritional process suggests a more natural alternative for the treatment of depression. Okay, it's not the be all and end all, but it's an interesting thing to think about in that process of change. All right? Now there's another way the DNA gets modified and we call this histone modification. It sounds really complicated, but it's not. It's just a set of proteins in the human body that are called histone proteins. They actually package the genetic material in your cells. They literally wrap around, and I'm going to show you a picture of how they package that DNA. But here's the interesting thing. They, when they package that protein, that will make certain areas of the gene or the genetic material either available or not for methylation and other activities because it kind of wraps itself around parts of that gene pool, so only certain things are available and visible. So what happens is it alters the exposure and action of DNA and genes and routine function and cell division. So it can affect the ongoing way that those genes express. Now to look at that, this is a picture of histone modification. You'll notice histone proteins. This is the DNA material. See all this stuff up in here? And the histones are all these beautiful ribbons, purple and green and red. Can everybody see that? Yeah. So these are, they act like spools. They wind around DNA, and they can expand and contract to alter gene function. I want you to think about that for a second. 
because we think of all of these things as so hardwired, stable, and static. This is as dynamic a process. Your genes are not sitting there waiting for something to occur. As if you're breathing, they're expanding and contracting and moving and gliding and dancing. That's what's driving this dance up here, probably. <laughs> but what they do is that they, when they do that, what's going to happen, histone modification can express and promote the expression of many degenerative diseases, including cancer, heart disease, and aging, because it makes areas of the gene pool available or not available for expression. And if the ones that express are ones that are going to promote degenerative change or damage, that's what's going to happen. If it doesn't, that's not what's going to happen. So the histone modification is kind of intriguing. Uh, genes that suppress tumors are present in all cells and can stop the growth of tumors. We have that ability. We have that inborn ability. Activities like fasting, in some ways, I believe, trigger some of this. We need to generate more of that data. But when we look at autophagy and the breakdown of tumors in a fast, I think we're suppressing things on a tumor growth. We're also suppressing, in some ways, I believe, the genetic expression of proteins like insulin-like growth factor, which drops on fast. So the proteins that are involved in abnormal growth will naturally change in certain ways in the body, depending on age and what you need. But in certain conditions, even like fasting, I believe it's happening. And it can be involved in the, so the actual way that we see the shrinkage of tumor growth. We see the shrinkage of cyst growths and tumors. Modified histones, these proteins that we're talking about, these beautiful ribbons of proteins, all can hug DNA so tightly that the sites on the tumors that suppress genes may not be accessible to the cell and cancer will develop. So remember we said all genes have sites that can either suppress or promote cancer growth, but if you tighten that DNA by wrapping these spools of protein around it, those areas that would block cancer may not be available. They may not be available to the body. So now they can't do the work of suppressing that cancer, and that cancer can grow. And so when we look at this, we find that broccoli, cruciferous veggies, garlic, onions, all promote histone modification that suppress cancer growth. So we're now seeing why some of these foods have such great anti-cancer properties in the body, because now we can see that they have an impact at a genetic level that's modifying this very sophisticated genetic machinery, but really not difficult to understand. You've got a DNA set up that's now being either hugged tightly or not, making areas either available or not that can suppress or promote cancer. It really comes down to that kind of simplicity, but that kind of profound simplicity and power. All right? Now, we're going to look at the impact of stress and exercise on genetic aging. And here we have a chromosome. I love this little picture of my chromosome. So electric, purple and green. Now, what you'll notice at the end of this chromosome, you've got this little green caps. These little green caps are what we call telomeres. Understand this, that when a cell divides, everything has to divide with it. All the genetic material has to divide so the cell that is born from that division gets all the, the important genetic material. Well, we find that as cells age, certain changes happen in the way DNA divides and replicates. And we find that one of the things that happens when a cell normally divides is that this cap, which by the way is very much like the cap on the end of a shoelace. You ever see shoelace that have the hard cap that keeps the shoelace from unraveling? This little telomere cap is just a repeating set of uh, some repeating units of DNA. That's all it is. But when the cell divides, that has to lengthen and divide with it. Now we now know that all cells have a natural lifespan. For example, when you produce a red blood cell, they live on average about 120 days. So after that 120 days, that cell is going to have to die and make way for a new one. Well, as that cell is dividing, as it's getting older, what we now know is that the length of the telomere is shortening and shortening and shortening until that cell dies. So we know that the shortening of telomeres in some ways is linked with the lengthening and division of chromosomes in cells. And there happens to be an enzyme aptly named called telomere ACE 
which is involved in the lengthening of that telomere. So we now know that as cells get older, the length of the telomere gets shorter, and the activity of that enzyme gets less and less until that cell naturally dies. So there's a linking, again, it's a correlative link between the telomere change and the aging process. So we have telomeres repeating units of DNA to stabilize chromosomes during cell division and growth. As cells age, telomeres shorten and the enzyme telomerase, which promotes lengthening and decline. We said that. Stress and stress management techniques, please hear this now, have epigenetic effects that will modify disease and aging. This is a very important piece. You know, historically, emotional poise was one of the major hygienic tenets. Dr. Shelton wrote about it a million years ago, and it still plays today. We talk about stress management, you know what that is? That's emotional poise. Mm -hmm. And so what we're talking about here is understanding that exercise promotes, also promotes telomere stabilization, decreased telomere shortening, and decreased aging. So this is another case for why sedentary behavior, sitting on your butt, promotes premature aging. Because activity will promote the stabilization of telomeres, making them very stable so they can lengthen and divide and be involved in that of the, of the cell. Now, telomere length and telomere ACE activity were measured, and this is one of my favorite mind body studies of all time by Ethel Blackburn. And some people have questioned it, but I, the, the technology that they did was, I think, pretty accurate. They took women, and here's a very important piece as we talk about stress, and this is important. You know, we talk about stress all the time, and it's a very high level abstraction because it means many things to different people. Stress can be something that's very positive. If you're an athlete or a performer on the stage, before you go off, a certain amount of stress may motivate and enhance your performance. But stress can be involved with catastrophic events, or it can be involved with the gnawing, nagging, bitching stresses of interpersonal relationships. <laughs> All of that plays under the umbrella of stress. But the natural response that we have to stress is what we call the fight or flight response, meaning that when you encounter a stress, imagine if I took you back into a primitive environment, and here you are now emerging from your condo cave. And you encounter some threatening tribe or animal. You basically got two choices. You can fight that situation head on, that may help you survive, or maybe you can turn around and run away. Fight or flight. It's a sympathetic response that happens in a part of the nervous system we call the sympathetic nervous system, and it's a fight or flight response. Now understand, if you're going to fight or run away, you have to get as much oxygen, energy, and blood into your muscles in the shortest period of time so that you can fight or run away. In fact, we can make the case that the only way you can do anything in your environment is through your nervous and muscular system. They become the medium for action. That's how we act on everything, emotional, physical, and spiritual. So all the actions of fight or flight are dictated and determined and set up to get as much blood and oxygen into those muscles. Well, two of those will be what? Raising your blood pressure and stress. So higher blood pressure is an issue. And the other is it changes your breathing pattern. Because think about this, if you're dealing with that threatening tribe or animal, how concerned do you think you're going to be with taking long, slow, deep breaths? <laughs> Not very. By the time you took one breath, you could be dead. So instead, what do you do? You do this. <coughs> breathing becomes very rapid and shallow. By the way, that is the breathing pattern of anxiety. And I contend that many people in our culture are breathing in the breathing pattern of anxiety, whether they have anything to be anxious about or not. But understand this, breathing is the most primal function you have. We know you can go a long time without food. We've all seen that. We know you can go some time without liquid, but you can't go three minutes without oxygen. So if you want to talk about the primary nutrient in the human body, it will be oxygen. Now here's the important piece. In ancient systems, yoga, tai chi have known this for many years. The way your breathing goes, so goes your emotions. You cannot breathe in a relaxed pattern of breathing and have an anxious state of mind. You cannot breathe in an anxious state of breathing and have a relaxed state of mind. And that's why many of these ancient systems work by working with breathing and breathing techniques because they know if they can adjust that and you can work with that and be mindful of that, 
you can get a handle on changing remarkable emotional states that you experience. But the bottom line is that pressure will go up, and all of the, the biggest problem we have is that in that past scenario, when you encountered that stress, you dealt with it in present time because you had to. If you didn't, you'd be dead. The problem is in modern times, we're no longer dealing with concrete tribes and animals. Our stresses have become more of the gnawing, nagging, bitching stresses of interpersonal relationships, the abstractions of human communication. So that instead of being effective in the present moment, we get lost in the sorrows of the past, or we become apprehensive and worried about our insecure future. The past has already occurred, the future may or may not happen, so those are both illusions. The only moment you got is the one that you're in. And when you lose contact with the moment that you're in, you become wholly ineffective in dealing with the stress at hand. Classic example. Here you are arguing with a loved one. Anybody in the room ever argue with a loved one? Raise your hand. I have both arms, both feet up. You can't see my feet up. And guess what happens? Your blood pressure goes up. You know why? It was designed to go up. It's part of the fight or flight response. But guess what? If you don't resolve that tension and you carry that tension from one argument to the next, that high blood pressure, which was set in motion for your benefit, will now be carried into your future as a condition of chronic disease. And if that blood pressure stays up high enough, long enough, guess what? It will damage the brain, it will damage the heart, it will damage the kidney, and I guarantee you, you will find an army of happy physicians that will treat every one of those problems. <laughs> that was not your problem. Your problem was the inability in present time to address the conditions at hand and understand that what you can do to resolve that conflict in the present moment so you become a wholly effective in dealing with that. And that's the reason why all stress management techniques, bar none, I don't care if it's yoga, breathing, meditation, all have one thing in common. They are designed in an alpha level to bring you clearly and solidly into the present moment. That's how they work and that's what they do. So we're going to talk about the fact that that kind of work becomes very important in the face of this, because in this study we took, and we also know that certain populations, especially in mind-body work, are more prone to the effects of chronic stress, and one of those groups are caregivers. People taking care of sick, dying relatives, family members, and the like, and we know when those folks have chronic stress, they have more vascular damage and depression, they have slower wound healing. They are more prone to bacterial and viral infection. So they are compromised by that effect. So now this study that we're doing here was a study done on women in the ranges of 40 to 50 years of age, one group caring for disabled, sick children for a good many, many years that they were observing and taking care of these sick children, and another group of the same biological age who did not have that stress. Understand what they did. They took white blood cell samples. They took blood samples from these women, isolated the white blood cells, and then did a genetic analysis on those cells, and this is the sophisticated part. They measured the length of their telomeres and the action of the enzyme that lengthens their telomeres, telomerase. And they used that as a marker for the aging effects of chronic stress of caring for sick children. You might have what they did. You understand what I'm saying, right? The results were quite clear. And what they found was, based on telomere short and decreased telomere activity, the women with that stress aged 10 years more than women of the same age, chronologically, who did not have that stress. I cannot think of a better mind-body study in my life than the impact of that kind of disabling caregiver stress on changes at a genetic level associated with aging at that level. It's a remarkable situation. Now, to, to look at that, just go, we'll go past this just for a second. This is the data associated with that study, and you'll see that the high stress... No, I, I'm going to go back. Relax. <laughs> this is the stress part of the story. <laughs> You know, they were talking, Mark was talking about when we went to Hilton Head, we, when we had to do that, that, that talk, I got up in front of 600 people in the, with all my slides, and the entire audio-visual program blew up in that theater. And there I was in front of 600 people without my slides. 
So I had to dance for an hour and a half to tell that story. <laughs> and at the end of that, they wanted me to come back and give a stress talk because they never saw anybody do that in the face of stress. <laughs> they didn't care about anything I talked about. <laughs> so here you see on this graph up here, this is the average telomere ratio, if you will. And you'll see that the high stress group had shorter. These are the length of telomeres, shortness, you see that. And this is the action of the enzyme telomerase. You see a very significant activity in the high stress group, a decrease in the activity of that enzyme compared to the ones that were not in that same kind of stress. All right? Now, we'll go back here. Oh, sorry. I do love that picture. Let's go to the last piece that was on the bottom here. Here we see chronically stressed caregivers of Alzheimer's patients showed increased depression, decreased immune function, and accelerated shortening of telomeres and decreased telomerase activity. And what you'll notice is that the result is even short periods of stress management. And this was just 12 minutes of daily meditation, 12 minutes, over a six week period, eight week period, decreased depression and increased telomere length and telomerase activity, meaning it promoted a decrease in aging, right? When the telomeres get longer and the activity is more. And that was just 12 minutes of daily meditation. Now I'm urging you to understand that we are constantly inundated with the chatter of our lives and we all need to step back from that chatter. And I'm gonna give you just a simple activity right now, if you will, put all your pens and everything down. Just put your hands in your, on your bellies as you sit there. And breath is going to go in through the nose and go down into your hands. As it breathes in, I want that breath to take an elevator ride down into your hands. Really rest it down here. Elbows relax. Everything relax. As you breathe in, slowly in your mind, count the number one and let that breath sink down. This is a combination of breathing and biofeedback. What's the biofeedback? If you're breathing properly, the diaphragm will drop when you breathe in and your hands will move away from the body. So watch me as I breathe in. If your hands are not moving, it ain't happening. So then you'll have to lay on your back or do it on, 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 some, on some other position. But right now, as we breathe in, watch my hands and slowly count to number one. And then we exhale. We slowly count to number two and we exhale slowly. By the time you get between five and 10, most anxieties in the moment are over. What's beautiful about this, when you breathe with deeper, slower breathing, it triggers a parasympathetic response in the body that gives your brain the signal that fight or flight is no longer necessary, and it will shut down that stress response. Now this is something you can do for just a few seconds to a minute in the workplace, driving in your car, because sometimes if you're at work, you can't say to your boss, excuse me, you're pissing me off, I need to go meditate a half hour. Can't do that. <laughs> but you can do this. Now understand this too. Stress is never in the events. It is always in the perception of the events. Not in the events. I have people that lose children, I recover, other people with hangnails can't get out of bed for a week. It's in the perception of the event. And my favorite story about perception as we wrap this up is the idea, this is a story of a young man who works on Wall Street, he's 30 years of age, and he wants to retire from life, he's had enough of this chatter and this rat race. So he hears about this monastery up in the hills of New York, and he goes and he meets with the head monk, and the monk says, you can come here, but I gotta tell you, we take this very seriously. And if you come here, you have to take a complete vow of silence, except every 10 years, we let you say two words. He says, fine. Goes and meditates in the woods, 10 years he comes back, the monk says, you have anything to say? He says, hard bed. Goes back to the woods. Meditates another 10 years, it's 20 years later, he comes back, the monk says, you have anything to say? He says, bad food. Goes back in the woods, comes back, it's 30 years later, and the monk says, you got anything to say? He says, I quit. The monk says, it doesn't surprise me, well, you've done is bitch since you got it. <laughs> now, to, to wrap this up, <clears throat> looking good in your genes. Understand, animal studies show that diet and lifestyle changes are not limited to one generation. They literally carry over. Now, we haven't seen that in human studies, but that's an interesting observation, that what you etch in the tapestry of that genetic matrix, that machinery, is actually transmittable across generations. 
Your genetic blueprint can dispose you, predispose you to both positive and negative conditions, like a bracket gene. What is it going to express? That's something you've got to see that can be affected by what you're going to do. Your routine <coughs> choices determine how, when, and even if your genes will express. So why make rash decisions based on just the anatomy that's there when you have so much power within your reach to make changes when negative predispositions may never even express? So why do something rash? Why do some rash surgery, rash treatment, when it may not even express? And those choices that we said can do so. Risky genes may never express. So don't drown in your gene pool. Free yourself from the constraints and fears that may dominate your concerns and embrace the power of personal choice. The power is in your hands. Yes, you've got a genetic machinery, but what you do by those personal choices can be profound. Your genetic foundation is not static. It is a shimmering tapestry, expanding, contracting, making sites available and not for things like methylation, food changes, exercise and stress management changes. You are not a prisoner shackled to your heredity. And finally, simple constructive hygienic choices of vegan plant-based nutrition, exercise and stress management, promote healthy gene expression, and eliminate the causes of disease and unhealthy aging. The power is in your hands, the beauty is in your hands. As you embrace these choices, you will make changes at the deepest cellular level that can enhance your quality of life and aging and give you the greatest opportunity to have the highest level of health at any age and time. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here.